the record button. So welcome everybody and those who are still probably to come and tune in. My name is Stacy Adi Demangate. I'm the lucky executive director here at the Wildland Museum of Art and Nature. I do see some names I'm pretty familiar with, but I also see some other names um, I don't know. So I do just want to say a couple words about the museum and then I'm going to introduce um, Chris, but um, I also want to mention that you're also seeing Lauren Sharp, our assistant director who helps with all manner of things, webinars, exhibits, uh, all of our marketing and all kinds of programming as well. So thank you, Lauren, for being here and keeping us on track and making this happen. Um, so just a few words about the museum. Uh, if you don't know us, we are a small nonprofit art museum and we use art exhibitions and programs to inspire people, hopefully, to uh, care about nature, want to be out in nature and think and care about the environment as a whole. It's literally a very beautiful place to work and I do feel very lucky to be surrounded by art of nature um, every day. And also through the work that we do and also how we literally just work here in this facility, encourage our community to follow our example and work and live as sustainably as possible. We are a California certified green business and we added solar panels, I think about a year and a half ago, which we're so glad that we did to minimize our carbon footprint, but also as it comes to find out, minimize our electricity bill, which has been kind of nuts lately for all of us. Um, please check out our website and all of our different social media channels if you want to keep apprised of our events and our programs and exhibitions. Uh, we're so excited with our Bird's Eye View Four Perspectives um, exhibition, which we opened last month. We have four very different artists that are participating, which is um, so fun for people to enjoy. And uh, we've gotten a lot of comments in our guest book that we have, particularly about Chris uh, Maynard's feather art, which I'll share a couple in a minute. And um, just to let everybody know, and I think I've already mentioned this to Chris himself, I actually saw his work at a Santa Fe gallery probably about six years ago when I was out there on a work trip to discover new artists. So um, as soon as I saw a few pieces of his work, I knew I, we have to get his work up here at the Wild Lane someday when the right show um, concept comes along. Um, of course, you can think that, but then you don't know if an artist is actually gonna wanna do it or not. <laughs> so there's all kinds of scheduling issues and shipping and everything else. So I was incredibly delighted when last fall we were developing the concept of this show and I reached out to Chris and he very quickly said, sure, I'm in essentially. Um, and that was just uh, amazing. So uh, Chris actually lives in uh, Washington state. So he shipped his work down to us uh, very carefully. It was amazing to see your packaging. I have to tell you, as we were unpacking it and given that it's feather art, we were worried like, what is this gonna be like to hang this artwork? And um, he, he knows his stuff, <laughs> it's so wonderful. Um, he just is so amazing and we're so glad that he's here today to talk about his work, his techniques, how he gets his feathers, um, and what are his inspirations. Chris has loved nature from what I read from a very, very young age and birds in particular. And he started uh, working with feathers as an art form at the advanced age of 12 years old. Um, so he's been at this for a while. He's a real conservationist. He cares about how and where he gets his feathers. So that's definitely um, a concern of his. And um, because these feathers are naturally shed, he pointed out um, in one of his writings that, you know, conceivably some of these birds could still be out flapping their wings and perching um, today, which is really fun to think about. He has incredibly precise techniques, which if, if you've seen his work in person, you know what I'm talking about. He really creates magical scenes out of these feathers. He's playing with positive and negative space. He's playing with shadows, depth. He uses shadow boxes so that there is a lot of depth with his work. Um, and it gives his work the room that it needs to, um, to play. And I use the word play because there's also something, like I said, magical and playful in how he does his amazing work. We have a guest book, as I mentioned, uh, where people are writing in comments after they leave the show, and Chris's work is often called out specifically. So one quote um, I found today, Chris, was, Chris Maynard, you are brilliant. Your feathers tell such a beautiful story. Love, love, love. And someone else wrote, Chris Maynard's art touched my heart. Such beauty and grace in his work. Thank you. 
So with that, thank you very much, Chris, for being here today. And I can't wait to hear more about your work. Well, thank you, Stacy, for those kind words and also for inviting me to the show where there's 20 pieces, I think. I think so. <laughs> so I work with feathers and I want you to come away with, if I'm successful um, in in my art and also in this talk, uh, seeing feathers in new ways and seeing birds in new ways. Next. Feathers, they're my medium and I will talk about them. I back them and uh, set them apart from their background, like float them off the background with little pins. Uh, they're about a, like, a centimeter off the background. So I'll talk about my art. But first, I want to talk about the feathers themselves, my medium. Sometimes, if I was in front of you in person, and I was a nervous speaker, I know some speakers, I've heard this before, and you may have too, that, that well, just picture your audience in their underwear. That I don't do that. But I do like to picture you and myself as having come here to this world covered with feathers. Because what if we had feathers, our world would be very different because feathers would keep us warm and dry. And we wouldn't need all our buildings and our roads if we could fly and our cars would be different. Next slide. Then next slide. So what are feathers made out of? Just like you and I are made out of the food we eat. If you ate your lunch today, that's, that's sitting in your belly and soon it will go into your bloodstream and make up your cells and your bones and your hair and your skin. And just like a bird, what it eats, becomes its body and its feathers. So if you're walking along and you happen upon say a robin feather, a robin that eats worms, and you're holding this beautiful feather, this delicate looking feather in your hand, you're essentially holding reconstituted worms. Next slide. And a robin repurposes its worms into long chains of fingernail type proteins. It's called keratin. And it's arranged in different ways to be uh, your fingernails and your skin, your hair, and also a bird's a beak, a bird's claws, and a bird's feathers. And the essential thing to know about keratin is it's the toughest of animal materials. And we think of feathers sometimes as being delicate. Feathers are light. Feathers are light because they're perfectly engineered to help a bird fly. Their body feathers are light to contribute to the ability to take off the ground and their wing feathers are light, but they are not delicate. It's a mistaken notion. They're light and feathers are just, they're very tough. You can take a feather and you can, you can mess it up and you can pull on it and, and try to break it, but it's really hard to break. They're very tough. Next slide. Unlike something I read on the internet and some kind of dubious evidence in my own garden in the fall, uh, feathers don't grow in feather beds. And these feathers, these turkey feathers, uh, never made any little turkey feather sprouts. Um, and what happens is people give me feathers. And this was after Thanksgiving and I got all these turkey feathers someone gave me. And a lot of them are kind of ratty. I, they're ones that I can't really use in my art. So I put a lot of feathers in my garden and they just get dug under. And they eventually rot. 
and my cabbages in the background eat um, and my kale grow. And eventually I eat that kale and incorporate that kale uh, into my body, which the kale had already incorporated the feathers into the kale. For, so for this kind of in a, in a, a circular way, maybe um, I'm a bunch of reconstitutive feathers talking to you right now. Next slide. I made up a word or two. I like to call a growing feather a fev. It's it's complete with a single artery and a single vein to supply its nutrients. And once it grows, the part that you see on the top is called the vein. They are it's kind of like a Velcro carpet. There are little hooks that keep that together. So it can make a feather look flat. And then that part is dead, just like our hair. It's, uh, but the part at the bottom, this feather was, was uh, pulled from a dead, uh, a dead bird and that was still growing the feather. Um, so once the feather is fully grown, I call it, once the fev is fully grown, I call it the feather. And then it provides its functions on the bird. The artery and vein have gone away and it provides all these wonderful uh, things for the bird, which I'll talk about. And then I kind of jokingly, when I carve and cut and make art out of the feather, I call it fevest. But really a feather can't be improved on by art or by us, but by our creativity. They've had eons to grow and become these incredibly complex structures. The more I learn about feathers, every week I learn something new and or just see something new in a feather. But by carving, even though we can't improve on feathers, but by carving them, I can make meaning in my art for us. Next slide. When a feather is fully grown, it will be, it will, uh, when all the feathers are grown on a bird, it'll be 10 to 20% of a bird's body weight. And that might not seem like a lot because if we were 10%, 15% bigger, it wouldn't be all that much. But remember, feathers are light. So they take up a huge bulk of the bird. I was in South Carolina at a, a wildlife rescue place for raptors, for hawks and owls. And they, this woman handed me this great horned owl. Um, she had the talons, which actually can like be pretty dangerous and go right into you. So she was holding them and she just said, why don't you just feel this bird? And I put my hands around it and it was, it was big. I mean, they looked big and fluffy. And my hands kind of sank into this bird and, and the feathers all compressed to this little skinny body underneath. There's a lot of feathers take up a lot of bulk. And a big feather, like a peacock feather, can take six months to grow between the time it's a little nubbin in the bird's body till the time it's fully grown and the artery and vein goes away and is fully functional. Most birds take a lot less time because they need to be able to use their feathers to fly around and get food and escape from predators. So uh, they'll, they'll take you know, weeks to grow. Next slide. And each flight feather, because if we, if we, I'm going to start talking about the uses of, of that birds put to feathers and the, the first, Thing we think of usually or often at least is flight because feathers definitely help a bird to fly each flight feather can be controlled by a, a muscle and a tendon the birds will have when i say flight feathers i'm talking about the primary wing feathers birds have primary feathers on their wings which help them uh, the power lift off and also control the direction of flight and then the secondary feathers, which are actually the feathers that you see here, are more to uh, hold a feather, hold a bird up and keep it aloft, provide lift. So I would like us to do an exercise uh, with your um, permission. 
if you would like to join me, if you could switch it to my view. I would like us to pretend that we're birds. And to imagine we're birds, we'll have, we'll imagine our feathers are finger feathers. And we're gonna be a, a, a little hawk that flies through the woods. So pretending that we're going to be these birds, we're gonna put our feathers out and you can put your arms out all the way. I just have to show you <laughs> on the video here on the small screen. And a bird is going to be going very fast. This is our first time doing this. So we're just beginners. So we're gonna slow it way down. And you have your flight feathers, your finger feathers, and you're flying along straight. You're gonna hold your finger feathers very steady because you wanna go straight. But there's a tree right dead ahead. So keeping everything steady and just move the index finger on one hand to get around that tree. And keep moving that index finger because there's another tree ahead. So keep everything stable, move that index finger. And now at the same time, move your pinky on your other hand to get around that tree. And there's another tree that's coming up, so switch. <laughs> and another tree, switch again. Okay, you can see how that is difficult. You could, you could switch back to that same slide. You can see how that's difficult for us. It takes some brain power. And I like this exercise because it gives us maybe sort of a, a small part of what flight is like for a bird. But remember, we have, instead of five finger feathers, a bird on each wing, a bird has probably about 10 of these primary wing feathers that it can control uh, for the needs of flight. And it's not going slowly, it's going fast. It's boom, 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 uh, making these little adjustments. And these birds are flying in three dimensions, not just two, which is what we may be thinking of as we're doing the exercise. They're both flying in three dimensions. And I like this exercise. Um, Partly, like I said, it might give us a little bit of an idea of what sort of what some of flight might be like. But it also gives me more respect for the birds because we often think that we are the best at everything and we're not. Uh, creatures can do a lot of things that we can barely imagine how they do them. Next slide. Well, one back. But flight isn't the only thing that feathers do for birds. They also keep birds warm. Remember I was talking about the vein of the feather that's, that's all looks like flat. That's what you see on a bird. That's what's exposed, just the tips. And the rest is downy warmth. This is a uh, Capricale grouse from Siberia and they live in a cold place. And you can see how these feathers curve uh, both side to side and front to back. And that is a bird's able to keep them compressed somewhat and keep still air uh, between their bodies and the feathers so that they can puff them out to make it thicker, just like a down coat. The thicker the down coat or the thicker the walls in your house, the more insulation you have. Same with the bird and these feathers. And I, I know that <laughs> I go out I go outside in the morning a lot and the first cold snap we had, we had frost on the ground and I didn't realize it. I go out in just my very light clothing, like a t-shirt. I go out that day and I go, Oh, it's cold. I come back inside and put my long underwear on and my heavier pants and a shirt and a sweater and a coat and a hat go back outside. And I'm somewhat warm, but then I get a little jealous because I look up in a tree and I I saw these three little songbirds and they're just puffed up looking very content. And all they had to just do is poof out their feathers. But all of this downy warmth doesn't work at all if the feathers get wet. Next slide. 
So the birds have several ways of keeping dry. And one way is pretty obvious, I think, like the shingles of a house, the feathers overlap and water rolls off of them. Another way that they keep dry is they have these little microscopic uh, structures in the keratin uh, and th that are deposited as when the feather is growing that act as, um, um, it's like when an ant falls on, on the puddle, say, and you look at that ant and it's just floating on the surface because it's not sinking because of surface tension. And that's what these bumps do. You can stick, well, this is a green winged teal. You can stick this feather in a cup of water and it will just pop right back out because of it. there'll be air captured between the um, the surface of the bumps and the feather itself that doesn't let the water get to it. So if you stick the feather back in the water, you'll see a little silvery sheen and that's the air. I'm gonna talk a little bit about color, <clears throat> the color of feathers, because there's two different ways that colors are made in feathers. And the first way I'm gonna talk about is structural and the other way is pigment. These green winged teal feathers have structural color and it's the way that light is reflected off the feathers. So feathers like this that are shiny, um, a lot of the blue feathers that you see, like from jays or uh, macaw parrots, if they're blue, or these green um, green winged teal, they, they have different ways of reflecting the light. And for, so for these feathers here, and for a lot of the shiny feathers, like peacock feathers, it, it's kind of, it's in just under um, the surface of the feather, a little microsculpture uh, that you can't see, uh, but are little grooves that are the exact width of the wavelength of light that's being reflected back. So this feather here, if the feather wasn't facing just right to reflect that light back into your eyes, it would be kind of grayish. Next slide. And then feathers are pigmented. And the most common by far um, type of pigment is our melanistic colors. And you're probably familiar with melanin because that's what colors makes our human skin so wonderfully varied, but not compared to birds at all because birds get all this wonderful patterns in their feathers also. If we had those patterns, we would be uh, a lot more diverse than we are in terms of how we look. So they use these patterns um, for a lot of times for camouflage or for other reasons. I probably don't have a clue about what they are um, and also for mating. Good. That, that was good. Next slide. Which brings me to my favorite bird for the, the patterns on its feathers. And I use these feathers a lot in my art because they're big, as you can see. And they're just these beautiful melanistic patterns on the bird that this bird uses for display. It, these, that big, long dotted feather, that eyed feather, it puts up kind of like a peacock. It's a wing feather, but it, where it raises it above its head uh, for display. But also they do, they all these other patterns act as camouflage for the bird. So I get a little obsessive with these feathers. And I just keep looking at them and looking at them. And I started seeing little A's and B's and C's and the numbers in the feather. And I go, oh, I'm going to take pictures of all those because I like to take pictures of feathers. And I took pictures of them. And I, uh, next slide, I made a poster of the ABC poster. Of, an, of a single species of, of bird, the Argus. So I said, oh, that was fun. I'm gonna make this really a lot nicer because I'm gonna make it colorful. So I had this, uh, I took uh, another single species, a parrot, which are often colorful and had beautiful, colorful feathers. 
but I noticed that the feathers were not very patterned. It, they were pretty much solid colors. So I, I looked at about a hundred species of parrots and I didn't find many patterned colored feathers. And I looked at about a hundred other species of birds, didn't find much. Next slide. So I did make this poster and you go, oh, wow, that's colorful. But if you really look closely, it's not that colorful. There's a lot of feathers, like probably two thirds of them that are just the melanistic colors. So I learned something with this that probably was the hard way to learn it uh, because ornithologists probably already know this, that uh, patterned colorful feathers are rare. And, and I think my hypothesis is that these birds um, can develop these colors um, and use them for display. And in part, because birds can fly and get, get away from predators. You don't see mice with bright colors. Uh, that that uh, that would probably be a recipe for disaster for them. But birds, why would birds mute their their colorful feathers if they're using them for display? Uh, why would they mute them with patterns? That's my hypothesis. I don't know if it's right. <laughs> Next slide. The bright colors, the oranges and the reds and yellows, the most common way that those are incorporated um, in their bodies as pigments is from the with the foods that they eat. And the most common type of uh, chemical that they use are, are carotenoids, chemical compounds, like carotene, like uh, carrots. I know that when I eat like sometimes I get like I get obsessive with feathers, but sometimes I get obsessive with what I eat. So I, if I drink like, way too much carrot juice, my skin and my face will turn a little orange shade. But fortunately, that goes away. And but birds have learned how to incorporate these colors into to metabolize them into their feathers. Next slide. And this red color is also metabolized into these turaco feathers. And these turacos live in sub-Saharan Africa, where there tends to be a fair amount of copper in the soil. And over eons, these birds have learned to uh, um, eat the fruit. They eat the fruit and their bodies have learned to, um, that has uh, fruit that has copper, their bodies have learned to metabolize copper into the color of their feathers, which I, in my mind, uh, this red looks kind of copperish. And they also uh, have uh, beautiful greens and blues. And again, reading on the internet, I, I saw this uh, story that these birds' um, feathers are, uh, the colors are water soluble, which I went, yeah, right. Uh, because I can't imagine the newly grown feather um, in their first rainstorm uh, losing all the color. Uh, so I, I put it in a glass of water. I dunked it in a glass of water. And you know what happened? It came right back out because it's waterproof. So I roughed it up and I got rid of that surface tension and stuck it back in the water overnight and came back in the morning and the water was clear. But next slide. I put a drop of soap in the water and immediately the color started coming out into the water, this beautiful cherry color and the, the feather turned kind of grayish. And I really wanted to drink it. I didn't, but it looked, it's quite beautiful color. Next slide. But well, birds have these feathers and they, they can also act as protection from their environment. I, I sometimes think of birds as having this feather armor that insulates the bird from its environment. But at the same time, these feathers can act as a uh, enhancers uh, for the bird to feel its environment through touch. Um, because well, we have our fingers at the tips of our appendages and birds have these feathers and feathers, unlike our fingers, don't feel they're dead, but they act as big levers that transmit any movement and enhance the movement all the way down to the nerve rich body where the feather is inserted. So the feather, one of the things that that can do is help the bird respond to the needs of flight by just detecting slight differences in air current. Next slide. 
I took a lot of pictures. I like just like taking pictures of feathers. And I took a whole series of pictures of feathers and what if their owners eat. And this was a Gila woodpecker that I found dead on the road in Baja, California. And I pulled out two of its tail feathers and put them on a bunch of grubs that I found. There's, let's see, beetles and termite grubs, larva. And I, this was to kind of tell the story of what happens when a bird sheds its feathers, because a bird will shed its feathers about once a year, some more, some less, but I like to think generally about once a year. And they do it at a time of year where there's abundant food because, well, it doesn't take very much effort for the bird to shed feathers. They just drop off when new ones grow in. But when the new ones grow in, growing back 10 to 20% of their body weight in feathers is that's a lot. So they do it at a time where they can have enough food to replenish their system to, for this feather growth. Um, they do it at a time when the babies are raised and before migration. Next slide. So we have these shed feathers and now is a good time to talk about how I get my feathers and the legalities of the feathers. About well, over a hundred years ago, there was a big fashion craze for feathers in ladies' hats, and not just feathers, but uh, whole birds. And people were killing all over the world. People were killing birds for their feathers. The uh, and and birds and the feathers were worth a lot of money, you know, like more than their weight in gold sometimes. So if you had a shotgun and some shells, and you knew where to find these birds, especially birds that were uh, really in demand for ladies' hats with like fancy feathers. You could make some money, and you could make a lot of, of money if you could find them all in one place and just shoot them all at once. And that's what happened in the United States with egrets because they all roost in one place. So they were getting decimated and people started noticing that and they started getting concerned and started lobbying uh, the legislature to the, and Congress to make some laws to like stop this from happening, which was successful. And now we have a law that's just over a hundred years old. It's called the Migratory Bird Act which says that you can't kill birds for their feathers and you can't kill birds for their meat and you can't kill migratory birds. Um, you just can't kill them. And <clears throat> that means that you can't have them also. You can't have these migratory birds like dead ones or live ones uh, or, and you can't have their body parts, which means you can't have their feathers. So technically a strict interpretation of the law is that you can't do what we did with that robin feather holding it up to see these reconstituted worms. That would be just a, a strict interpretation that would be illegal to have. And I know a lot of people have their uh, altars of feathers because feathers are beautiful and complex and they retain their, their beauty after they're shed. But you're not supposed to uh, pick them up. Um, or have them. And it's a good thing to know. Um, I, I know a lot of uh, um, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that is tasked with enforcing these laws. Um, they have a lot of work and they probably have bigger fish to fry than you. <laughs> and so, but it's good to know. I mean, like if you're going along the freeway at 70 miles an hour, or you're going at 71 miles an hour and a 70 mile an hour speed limit, you're probably not going to get stopped. Um, uh, and also there are, it's, it's nice to know that there are feathers that you can have, and that's from domestic birds and also birds that people hunt uh, because people some of the birds that people hunt, the feathers you can have, like turkeys. And 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 when people hunt ducks, uh, they can have those feathers. 
So, which comes to like, well, where do I get my feathers? One kind of feather I get are from turkeys. And that's one exception to uh, having feathers from shed that are shed because turkeys are often Thanksgiving dinners and people raise these heritage turkeys, which come in all sorts of beautiful melanistic colors. And they're, they're big, the wing feathers and the tail feathers are big and flat and I can carve them. Yeah. They're big canvases for me. And also I like them because they're one feather I can export without any permits. Otherwise exporting out of the country, uh, it takes a, a fair amount of, of money and time to get the permits. So I get my feathers from that aren't turkey feathers from birds that aren't from North America, but are raised in North America. So think of all of the many kinds of parrots that there are in zoos and private aviaries. And also think of all, there's 55 species of pheasants. And most of them are raised in the United States in some way or other in private aviaries or in zoos. And they shed every year. There's other feathers that are not legal to have um, that are from other countries and birds that are endangered. So I have to be aware of that and not use endangered uh, bird feathers. Next slide. So people ask me, well, why, why did I use feathers? Why, why is that my medium? There's, I have a couple answers to that. And one is any artist is trying to capture something of the essence of life. And feathers already have something of the essence of the bird that shed them. So if I am portraying birds, I'm a step ahead of other artists. That's the only step ahead I am because Otherwise, feathers are, they are only come in certain sizes and shapes. So I have to be very creative in, in my designs and how I uh, make, how I create my designs uh, in order to capture uh, the meaning that I want and, and come up with a unity of design. And I want to keep the feathers integrity because I want to honor the birds and, and keep their, well, like what I call their featherness. And so I don't change their color or their shape. I mean, I do carve into them, but I try to keep something of their featherness. Next slide. Another reason that I chose to use feathers is that feathers hold cherished meaning for probably all cultures in the world and all, all ages, everybody. And I think that's for the same reason that they hold meaning for me is because I want to fly and in my body, I can't. So feathers are symbols of this aspiration of wanting to fly. They're symbols of flight, of transformation, of getting from here to there, from our escape, all sorts of symbolism uh, so is associated with feathers, just as the symbolism is associated with birds. Next. The first time somebody had sent me a picture of, they hadn't asked, but I was still honored of my design um, that they tattooed, I went, wow, feathers really do have a lot of symbolism uh, for some people because if you're going to tattoo this on your skin for the rest of your life, it's got to have some important meaning. Next slide. And making meaning helps us to make sense of the world. But it's important to me to just remind us that this is our need to make sense of the world. It doesn't really have much to do with the birds themselves. 
These aren't images of big-breasted love demons. Uh, they're not images of hearts or heart-lipped faces or deer hoof prints. As far as I know, the reason that these patterns are on a sharp-tailed grouse is for the sharp-tailed grouse to hide. The camouflage. So uh, these feathers are really innocent participants in our in our mind's imaginations. Next slide. I get my inspiration from a lot of sources. And to start with, I want to honor my mother because, well, she was the first source <laughs> for me um, for art. She was a professional artist. And she was a professor at one time, and then she had us kids and wasn't a professor anymore, but she always did her art. She was in a nice gallery and had a, a, a following in the Northwest. And this, and she did oils, and then she did watercolor, and then finally, the last 20 years, she, did, or she worked with sumi, which is a Japanese uh, type of art that tries to capture the essence of nature in as simple a brush strokes as possible. And she was good at it. And she probably did this little bird that was outside her studio that was at my home. She probably just whipped that out very quickly. And I, after she died, I, I had her sketchbook and I was, uh, I was looking through it, saw this picture and thought, oh, I'm going to make a little piece in honor of her, which I, you know, it's not as nice as her Sumi. It's just different. Um, and not as Sumi-ish. Next slide. But the most important artists that have inspired me are the artists that have come before us for most of our time as humans here on Earth. That's 95% at least of our time here on Earth. And that's the Paleolithic, the hunter-gatherer. And hunter-gatherers had to be more aware of how they were relied on creatures, other creatures, and just more, more connected with uh, the creatures of the earth that support their, their life. And now we live in cities uh, for the most part, and we're surrounded by creatures and they're us. And our art tends to be mostly about us, which is why I want to keep working with birds and not people, even though I've, I've tried to do a few, which you'll see next. Another big inspiration, that may be the biggest are the birds themselves. And I'm a birder, but I don't really go. I, I mean, I like to see new birds, but I don't really make lists or I don't just look at a bird, then go to the next one. Usually I, I just like to watch what they're doing and get to know the birds themselves. So I was in the Uinta mountains at 11,000 feet um, with, with a friend of mine hiking and I was pretty far ahead of her and, I sat down in a glade and was just kind of staring ahead, watching, thought I was being pretty attentive. But after about five minutes, out popped this grouse that was just right in front of my eyes. And then in a few seconds later, out popped all these little baby grouse following her. I made some kind of movement and they all, blip, 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 they were gone. <laughs> Again, I couldn't see them. Uh, so I went back to my studio and made this piece. Uh, and I, this is made out of rough grouse feathers. And I really like it when I can make a piece, the silhouettes of a bird, of out of the feathers, a bird I'm trying to portray. Next. And recently I've realized that all along, a big inspiration for me has been this kinesthetic feeling in my body. It, I think it might have started when I was a kid because I, I grew up skiing, downhill skiing, and I would live for these like moguls that I could like take, get a little air off of and feel like I was weightless. And then boom, I'd be right back down on the ground. So I'd try it again and again. 
And I think that that feeling has been with me all my life since then. And now I don't I don't ski much anymore. It's a lot of work to get up to the slopes. But I do have a dance floor in my studio where I'm sitting right now behind me. There's a dance floor and I have music on, all kinds of music. And when the mood takes me, I start dancing and I can get that feeling that just that feeling of the apogee and the perigee of the of uh, swooping and soaring a little bit by dancing. And the other uh, kind of inspiration I have right now are the barn swallows that have just come back to my barn and they're sw flying all around. And I almost feel them in my body when they go up and then they go back down again and they, they hit the bottom of their flight and go back up again. Next. As I said, I do birds, but here I did people. <laughs> I don't do very many, um, but I just had some, this idea that I like to mix it up. Like this is called the alternative creation story. Um, in part, I, 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 you know, when you were growing up, I don't know if you had this, but I did in the, in all the books, uh, humans are at the top of this pyramid of life. We're like the, we're like the top. Um, we're kind of separate from everything else. Um, we're not really part of nature. Um, it's And I call it human exceptionalism. We're separate. And I think it allows us to do a lot of things, a lot of extractive things um, to the earth that that's that not good and coming back to bite us. So in my most of my work, I want to give birds a, a voice. I want to honor the birds and the creatures. And I can find I can have enough uh, meaning in my work that it satisfies me and I can get across what I want to say. Next slide. Choosing the right feathers is a big part of what I do. It take, I just sometimes I'll sit for a long time, just holding a single feather, getting an idea of what to do. And then if I do have an idea, it might take a long time to find all the right feathers. So here's an example of a, of a piece that I'm doing. I laid out a template because it's a kind of complex piece, a lot of feathers. And these feathers are shiny, you can see, but you can also see that they're not, they're not angled toward you. So the light's not reflecting off all of them. So a lot of them look kind of dark, black even. Next slide. I'll take these feathers and and spend hours arranging them just right. And then, but they're still not angled right toward you. But then I'll angle them just right. Next slide. So that the, the uh, colors are all reflecting right toward the viewer. Next slide. And since almost all feathers curve, I don't flatten them. I don't paste them against the background, as I've said. I raise them apart from the background. And by doing that, by respecting their shape, I feel like the feathers have given me something that's really important and integral to my art, and that's shadows. Next slide. So each piece will vary depending on how the light shines on it, on the quality and the direction and the intensity of the light that shines on it. Next. This is a pretty accurate picture of me. Uh, I'm, I wear magnifying glasses. My father was an ophthalmologist. So I like to use his old ophthalmology magnifying glasses, but it's this one's really for show for the picture. I usually use a more clunky pair, but otherwise it's pretty accurate. I'm, I'm it's close work. Um, but there's another thing that's not accurate about this in this picture, and that is, remember that slide a few years, a few slides ago, where there was, I was arranging a lot of shiny feathers. Well, one breath can send them all flying, so I can wear. I'll wear a bandana. Actually, no. Nowadays, I'll wear a N95 mask <laughs> to uh, keep me from from just ruining hours of work. Next.
we want to, we need to make sense of the world. And we do it through science. We make sense of the world through religion, philosophy, myth, our stories, and symbols, and our art. Because the meaning that we ascribe to feathers are useful to us in some way to make sense of the world, we'll be using feathers in art for as long as we and the birds are here together on this earth. Next slide. So this is the last slide I'm going to show you of a bird's feather and what its owner eats. It's a long-legged buzzard and it eats mice. And I took three dead mice and put it under the feather to take the picture, took the picture, and then truth be told, I put a little sparkle in Photoshop in each one's eyes. And, and I show this picture for a reason because living is harsh, or at least it seems harsh. When we're born, it's a contract to die. And we have to kill things and birds have to kill things in order to live, in order to grow, in order to eat. And we kill things either directly or indirectly to have these computers that we're looking at, to have the clothes that we have on, to get from here to there, to have our houses. So even though it's a beautiful, wonderful cycle of life, part of me cries out for a little, a little gentleness, and feathers do this for me. Next slide. With For feathers, beauty and wonder have the upper hand. Admittedly, the birds have to kill and eat in order to grow these feathers, but then they perform these marvelous functions on the bird, and they're gently let go, and yet they retain their beauty and their complexity. Next slide. Last slide. I hope, no, next slide before that. I hope that you'll leave here today seeing feathers and birds in new ways. Like a falling leaf, a shed feather is a gentle reminder of the cycle of life and they're a gift from the bird. That's it. Thank you. Chris, wow, thank you so much. That is so inspiring. Um, uh, a lot of things to think about and absorb. Um, we do have some questions. Um, you re One of the photos showed a lot of holes being punched out of a feather. I loved that particular one. And Kevin Patterson's wondering if you, do you use a punch or how do you make those perfect, perfect circles? Well, the circles are an exception. I use biopsy punches. Hmm. There's they're circular and yeah. Um, nowadays, people use uh, disposable ones. I have a lot of old ones, old ones that can be resharpened that were mm -hmm. from. Yeah, they're metal and they're not recyclable. And okay. then use for the rest of the feather. I use a tiny scalpel. I mentioned that, yeah, my father was a, a, an eye surgeon and I use, well, I've used a lot of his tools. I've broken a lot of his old tools. He's gone now. Uh, so, but I use tiny, tiny scalpels and the blade is about, it's not very big. Yeah. Great. Great. So Marilyn Townsend uh, typed in that she loves your alternative origin piece and that that's what she loves about your work that you're able to step away from the anthropomorphic lens and, and think about things in a very different ways. I, and I loved how you were talking about dancing and thinking about birds and how you do that, um, that you're so drawn to birds in a very, very deep way. And they are magical creatures. I mean, if you think about it, who doesn't have a dream at some point in their life about flying, you know, themselves? Yeah. Yeah, well, and thank and thank you, Mary, for that comment um, because that's really important to me because I I don't see a way out of our dilemma as humans here on Earth without coming to terms with that that idea that we are uh, that we're separate from this Earth. Uh, she also typed, do you need to use some sort of fixative in order to cut the feathers without them splitting? Yeah, I did a lot of research to to figure out how to do this. 
and I could cut a feather because they, they have barbs with little hooks in them that make mm -hmm. these veins and you can cut them, but they will, they will hold together, but they will lose their structural integrity and they'll kind of flop around. So I, I figured out a process with glues and paper and pressure to back them. So like a lot of art, it's a little deception. What you see is the feathers, but behind them, there's, there's a sturdy, um, backing. Yeah, I know Lauren and I, um, and Lauren, if you want to speak to it too, but when we were unpacking your work and so we're, we're holding these and we're putting them on the wall and they're so firm because my panic was that, oh my gosh, little pieces are going to fall off or the feathers are going to like, you know, open up. So that explains that. <laughs> and that, that also speaks to almost all, all of our, our, um, kind of initial impression of feathers that they're delicate and they're not. And my work isn't delicate either. It does make me wonder, um, are there certain feathers that you stay away from that don't work well, or can you work with any type of feather? I can work with um, feathers that are big enough for me to carve, like hummingbird feathers, just they don't do it. <laughs> They're too yeah. small. Um, and uh, yeah, mainly they need a big enough vein and I just and, and sometimes I experiment with feathers that are um kind of unusual just to see if I can do it I just did a piece with go golden pheasant tail feathers which are which are tent shaped they're long but they're each side instead of going straight out they they they're like a tent and and so that was they're, they're just, it's just harder and I have to figure out new techniques. Uh, Kevin Patterson has a couple of questions. Um, do you sharpen your tools, your, the blades that you're using to keep them where you need them? Yeah, I sharpen the biopsy punches. I don't use them very much, but I do use disposable scalpel blades. Mm. Okay, um, and he's wondering about, do you worry about protection from insect damage? He used to work with butterflies and he, you know, use mothballs for those. So is there any you should with that with the feathers? Yeah, feathers, when I get them, when I get a feather, I clean them and I immediately will put them into the freezer and isolate them from the other feathers because they mm -hmm. can contain mites and yeah, and, and so I freeze them for 48 hours at zero degrees or below and take them out for another 24 hours and freeze them again for another 48 hours, just in case anything hatched. And um, that's what museums do these days. Mostly mm -hmm. they don't use the chemicals. Um, and then I, I, when I store them, I keep them in plastic uh, or containers that are totally closed. And then the pieces themselves are not um they're all sealed right yeah and if you see if you can see in my studio can you see the very back wall mm -hmm. there's a there's a whole bunch of feathers there that i've just i've had for 20 years they were in my barn i'm doing a remodel in my barn right now so i i took these out after 20 years in the barn i kind of lost track of them and brought them back and they're not really terribly sealed or anything. And they were all in great shape. So I have a question myself. Sorry, Lauren, you next. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you yourself kept any birds as pets, both maybe for the companionship and to connect with birds? I've had a few in my lifetime and they're, they're very special and different, um, but also because they're, they're a source of feathers. <laughs> Yeah, I used to raise geese, mm -hmm. but the coyotes have taken them all, mm -hmm. and so I don't do it anymore. And I raised, I raised for like, gosh, ten years or more, uh, exotic pheasants because mm. I had these cages in my barn, and, and uh, I got in touch with different aviaries and zoos because of that. And we have all these sources of feathers now. Mm. Not that I even need it now. I have a huge bunch of feathers. But yeah, then they were more, they weren't like pets, like parrots mm. are people. They were, they were kind of in between a farm animal and a pet. 
I was curious. Um, there's a couple of pieces in our show that have different um, papers or materials, um, particularly the wasp J piece. And I was wondering um, what inspires using different kinds of papers as backings. I, use, I like, like to use white usually because it really shows off the feather. But if there's a white feather I want to use, I might use a darker background. It's pretty rare that I do, but sometimes. And I've also used, um, I've sent my goose feathers to a woman in Maine who's incorporated them into her handmade paper and sends it back. Oh, I've oh. used that. You might have a piece or two like that. I think I know the piece because it's kind of on the back of um, that rabbit piece that we have. Okay. I'm blanking on the title. And then the wasp papers, I'd like to use um, materials that aren't, that aren't from a, something that's been killed. So the wasps make these nests and then they, they're gone in the fall. So there's all these big wasp nests around. And then they make, uh, they go out and chew wood and bring it back. And when they're spit, they make a little small little blip of their saliva mix with the pulp and then they'll come back and do another one and another one and they make this paper that if they go to different sources it might be different colors that they're usually browns and whites and grays usually so i i tried at one point to get a wa get wasp feed them not feed them but give them colored construction paper to uh, make really colorful paper it wasn't very successful with those big paper wasps but I was pretty successful with one they're called polistes they make the open nests that don't have the big other nest around and I and they made some kind of pretty nests with uh let's see blues and reds <laughs> a neat idea yeah. I use snakes uh, shed snake skin sometimes too yeah, yeah that was my my other thought too I love that piece with the snake pattern and the snake in the center. Yeah. Are there any bird species with amazing feathers that you just, for whatever reason, you cannot get a hold of that you're just pining someday? Maybe you can, <laughs> you can use. Uh, well, it, it probably would have to do with legality. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm just like totally. Those are not an option. So I don't really pine after them, except for one. Is really, mm -hmm. I would love to see. I just want to see the feather and take pictures of it. I don't need to have it or anything, but that's the, uh, the cousin to the biggest piece you have of mine that you're showing. And that's, uh, you're showing a uh, tail of the Argus, the great Argus that I showed pictures of that I made the alphabet out of that feather is about four feet long ish. The it's cousin, the crested Argus has feathers that are longer than that. And like, mm -hmm. Three times as four times as wide. It's the, the most massive feathers in the world. It's huge. Wow. And beautifully patterned too. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's even any here in the United States, well, that are legal. <laughs> um yeah. Like I haven't even seen any in museums. Well, I hope someday maybe you'll get one. <laughs> I don't I don't really want to have one because I, I want to mm. support the conservation, you know, you know yeah. Laws. Well, yeah, uh, but definitely. I would like to see see them. I know they're in a couple of zoos like in Vietnam, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right. I have I have just one final question if if no one else has any to pop in, but the big comment that keeps coming up is just admiration for your patience and the amount of time that people are wondering how long it takes for you to complete a piece. Is there a general time frame, or it just depends on the feather? Well, when that question is asked often, it's about the carving of the feather, uh, but it takes a long time to find the right feather. Sometimes it takes a long time to find the right feather. Then I, um, I draw what I'm going to do. I draw it out in a kind of a rough sketch. I'll put it on the computer and and I have to back the feather. 
and then take a picture of the feather. I put that on the computer and size my drawing to the feather as a template and then put that on the back of the feather. Then I'll start cutting it and then, and then mounting and everything. So the carving is not as long. Um, it's not, it's, it's part of the process. It's not the whole process. I just want to read a couple of closing comments from folks that have put them in the chat room for you. So Lynn Hansen, who's a wonderful artist uh, that we've worked with in the past, she says, what a lovely, sensitive, informative presentation, really touching and so much food for thought. Your deep relationship with the natural world truly comes through in your magnificent work. Thank you, Chris. And Marilyn Townsend, thank you, thank you. I find your work just transcendent for me. Um, and for me, this talk certainly has even added um, to that. So I'm very grateful. Yeah. Uh, Marlon Harms, who's a wonderful local photographer that's helped us out with some projects in the past. Wonderful art and great discussion about it. Thanks. So with that, we are after five o'clock. So we should probably wrap this up and just, Chris, thank you so much. Thank you for being part of our show. Um, being a highlight for most all the visitors through it are just blown away and uh, we're just grateful for all your time today and all your insights and thank you lauren for your assistance with all of it and thank you chris it's been such a pleasure working with you and just what stacy said it's wonderful to have you in the galleries and see it every day thank you for having me in the gallery and thank you for this opportunity to share on, on this talk all right. All right. Thank you and have a great night, everybody. All right. Bye.